Psalms 46, verse 4. The Bible says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of his tabernacle, of the tabernacles of the Most High. God, I am I. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. There is a river. Jesus tells us very clearly in the book of John. Let me look for the scripture. Hallelujah. He said in John chapter 7, verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That statement by itself could not be understood. And so in verse 39, he explains what he was referring to in verse 38. He said, this spake he of the Holy Spirit, glory to God, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't died as at this time and he hadn't been lifted up into heaven to sit at the right hand of majesty so that he could send back the Holy Ghost like he promised in John chapter 15. Chapter 14, 15, 16 talks about the Holy Ghost. So he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In the Old Testament, David had a foresight. God allowed him to see into the future. Because they didn't have the Holy Ghost back then. Only the prophet, the priest, and the king had access to the Holy Ghost. And he would come upon them for a season and lift off of them. He would come upon them for service and then he would lift off of them. You carry him on the inside of you. You show up, God shows up. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, you carry the power that created the entire universe. Some idiot somewhere is telling you to speak to the universe when you carry the power that created the universe. What universe are you speaking to? Who or what is that universe? You hear something from some people, you don't check. You don't seek. You don't do your due diligence. You start to run with rubbish. Speaking to the universe. I know who created the universe. I don't need to speak to the universe. I speak to the one who created it. Glory to God. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Where is the city of God? Where does he dwell today? He dwells inside of you. The Bible says he no longer dwells in temples built by hands. Come to Acts 17. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 17 verse 24. God that made the world, ay, 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 ay. God that made the world, including the universe you're talking to, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples built by hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life 
and breath and all things. The city of God literally is on the inside of you. I listen to people, my depression, my, my allergy, my headache. Who gave it to you? Who told you it's yours? Can I walk into your house and just pick up anything I like and make away with it? Won't you stop me? Maybe out of respect, you know, Pastor Mo. What's up? That's mine. But if, if it was someone you didn't know, could they walk into your house and just pick up anything that they like and walk away with it? So some devil is going to come and take your joy. Some devil is going to come and take your peace. Some devil is going to come and take your health. Some devil is going to come and take your money. Some devil is going to come and take your son or your daughter or your, or your husband or your wife or anything that God has blessed you with. There is a river. The streams, the streams of that river. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Well, this is the city of God. He has chosen not to dwell in temples built by hands. He has chosen to dwell on the inside of man. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. Whether the world accepts it or not, it's true. We just need a place to congregate. That's why we build buildings. We don't need buildings. We are the lively stones. Second Peter tells us that. We're lively stones being built up into a spiritual house for our God. Psalm 22 verse 3. It says, O thou that inhabitest the praises of your people. He lives inside us. He lives inside our praises. When we want him to show up, we praise him. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Not by man, not by devils, not by situations, not by circumstances, not by lack. Not by abundance, not by, I am not moved by anything. I know whose I am, and I know who I am. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. We study the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse, because we believe no one buys a book, jumps around the chapters, the verses, and the paragraphs and sentences in it, but you read it from the beginning to the end. That way you're able to understand the book and understand the mind of the author. That's why we study the Bible like we do. And I give God every praise. I ascribe to him all glory and honor because when he first told me to do this, I was scared stiff. I'm like, God, what am I going to say every day? It's one thing to preach from Sunday to Sunday. You have an entire week to prepare yourself. But God says, do it. And he has showed up every blessed morning. This wasn't planned. It was the song that opened up the floodgates. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I hope you understand what I just shared with you this morning. And not let any anything, anyone, any situation push you back and forth. Whatever you're going through, it is temporary. It says, yea, though I walk through. Psalms 23. I'm not stuck in there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not even the real thing. It's a shadow. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod for correction and staff for guidance. They comfort me. And then he prepares a table for me. And he doesn't give a rip. It's in the presence of my enemies because he knows my enemies cannot touch me. He's empowered me to the point where I can sit at that table. I can eat what he has prepared for me and there's nothing the enemy can do about it. Talk to me, somebody. This is who you are.
We've been studying the Old Testament. We're almost done with it. We're in the book of Haggai. Haggai is one of those books that you very rarely hear from. Hallelujah. But there's a lot of truth in it. Glory to God. And if you would put your cameras on, I think it's rude to not put your cameras on when we come together. This is fellowship with our God and with one another. It doesn't matter if you haven't bathed. It really doesn't matter. I don't care. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you're on the job and you can't, if you're driving and you can't, I understand. What's to tell me that you're actually listening? What if you're logged on and you're somewhere else? Hallelujah. We're in the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Glory to Jesus. After Haggai, we have Zechariah, and then we have Malachi. All right? As a brief background, Haggai was a prophet that ministered during the remnants after the 70 years of captivity uh, by uh, the Babylonians and the uh, succeeding kingdoms. All right? Uh, the circumstances under which he ministered are detailed more in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, all right? Uh, and I know you, many of you were not here when we uh, when we studied it, praise God, but we're going to start over again. We'll finish the New Testament, and, and we'll start over with the Old Testament because a, a whole bunch of you were not here. And uh, until God gives me different instructions, I'm going to keep teaching just the Bible. That's all we need, all right? I'm not interested in revelations and I'm not interested in power. I'm not interested in any of those things. They will come. They are byproducts of knowing him. Hallelujah. All right? Um, his, 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 uh, his book, Haggai's book, was written to encourage, but also to correct and to uh, strengthen the weak amongst the people. You'll see it as we read it. And... Uh, he also challenged them uh, in a challenge that is so relevant to now. I, I, I cannot get over the wisdom of God and the way that he structures things for us to be reading the book of Haggai the last week before we actually start the in-person uh, services that we're going to be holding uh, going forward. We've already outgrown the place that we got. So we're going to spend the month of April looking for somewhere else. Glory to Jesus. All right. Haggai chapter one. In the second year of Darius, the king, and in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, for ye have not enough. Ye drink, for ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag of hopes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, said the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, 
and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. The chapter opens up by letting us know very clearly who's speaking and who's writing and the time at which he was writing. And if you recall, when we studied the book of Ezekiel in particular, um, Ezekiel was a prophet who ministered during the captivity uh, in Babylon. And um, the king of Babylon had had a dream that puzzled him. He didn't uh, remember the dream, number one. Number two, he didn't know the interpretation of the dream. So he sent for all the wise men and he told them, listen, guys, I dreamed a dream and I need you to tell me the interpretation. And they were all waiting. And he wasn't saying anything. And finally, one of them said, what is the dream? He said, I don't remember. If you're a wise man, tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation as well. And the wise man said to him, that's not possible. There's nobody on this earth. I can tell you what your dream is and then tell you the interpretation. If you tell us the interpretation, we if you tell us the dream, we will tell you the interpretation. And he said, no, I don't remember. And if you all don't tell me what it is, I'm going to have your heads. And so the decree went forth that all of them be killed, including Daniel, who was one of the wise men. Uh, I meant to say Daniel, I said Ezekiel. Including Daniel, who was uh, one of the wise men in the king's court. And so he, with his uh, buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, went to the Lord in prayer with fasting and asked the Lord to help so that they would all not die. Cut a long story short, God tells him what the dream is, and God tells him the interpretation. And so he became more or less the right-hand man to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. The dream that he saw was a statue that had a head of gold, a chest of silver, a torso of bronze, legs of iron, and feet with a mixture of iron and clay. And the interpretation of that dream was that there were going to be successive empires that were going to come and plunder the people of God for all of their own iniquities. The head of God was Nebuchadnezzar, the king of uh, Babylon. After him, the, the chest of silver was going to be this man, Darius, the king over the Medes and the Persians, the Middle Persian Empire. And if you go back to history, that's exactly how it happened. Exactly. To the times and the seasons and the length of years. So let no one tell me that this book is an ordinary book. And I tell people, if you've never read it, be quiet. You have no right to comment on it or speak about it. All right? So this is this time that Darius was king. And the word of the Lord came to Haggai, and he went to uh, the prophet, uh, uh, rather the, the priest, the high priest's son, uh, to, to tell him what it is that he had seen. At that time, the people of Israel had been having conversation concerning the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had burned down when he seized Jerusalem. Because the Bible says in verse 2, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So what they were thinking in their own homes, in their own hearts, God showed his servants. Guys, these are Old Testament priests that did not have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. They had the Holy Spirit for service. We go to sleep and wake up with him 24 hours a day. 
and yet we're not as sharp as these guys in hearing God, in understanding God. And this bothers me. We're carriers of the Godhead. And we live our lives in any which way that we want. Go where we want, do what we want, eat what we want, sleep with whoever we want. We do all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. Forgetting who we are. Things they were thinking and saying, God showed his servant. And in Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will see these things before death close my eyes. I will see the self-same miracles. Because it's not a lie. I will position myself in a place where I will see God do the self same things today. And so he went and he prophesied to them by the spirit of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet came saying, is it time for you guys to be comfortable in your own houses, your own beautiful houses, apartments, whatever, wherever that you live? Dwell in your sealed houses while the house of the Lord lies in waste? Now, therefore, think on your ways. Consider your ways. Is it right for you to be comfortable wherever it is that you live and the work of the Lord is suffering and lacking? Why are you not giving to your church? Because of what you see pastors doing with it? Why? Why don't you give? Is it fear? Self-preservation. If I give, what's going to happen to me? How am I going to manage? First of all, who made you a manager? Is it time for you to be comfortable while the work of the Lord is in need and you're not responding? Don't disqualify yourself because of somebody else's foolishness. God commands me to give. And I give. What the pastor decides to do with it is between him and God. He will answer our God at the end of the day. Don't let this stupidity rob you of your blessings. Give to the church. Give to the needy. Find a good place where you know when you give is going to be used for the purpose for which it was taken up. Bible says in verse 6, after telling them to consider their ways, he says, you have so much and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, filled. You clothe, they're not warm. You earn wages and you're putting them in pockets with holes. That is to say, everything that you're doing is never enough because you're failing to observe the laws that govern prosperity. I would be stupid to say because the church that I go to, well, the pastor drives in Rolls Royce and the pastor lives in an eight room, eight bedroom mansion or whatnot, I'm not giving anymore. You're shooting yourself in the foot. What he does with it is none of my concern. My concern is with the God who said I should do it. He's the one I'm going to go back to that, Lord, I have obeyed. I know it can be annoying. I know. I've worked with pastors. I've worked with many pastors. I've seen them start out with flip-flops where they're wearing red, red soles. 
And if they were working, if they were working in some bank or company or wherever, they wouldn't be earning what they are earning. But don't bother yourselves with that. Do what God has told you to do and watch. Guys, I came from welfare. I came from $356 every two weeks. And food stamps. Not a card like you carry now and nobody can tell the difference. Ours was coupons. $1, $5, $10, I used to joke, I said, with my children and I, we used to say we've eaten all the turkey necks in New York. Because that's all we could afford. Ramen noodles. And if I wanted to jazz it up, I'll put some mixed veg in it. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. It was a day I was trying to pay my bills. <laughs> I know I'm digressing, but I got to tell you this. I brought out all the bills and I was I was calculating, all right, I'll, I'll pay $20 here and I'll wait on this one. And, <laughs> and the Lord said to me, you witch. And I said, Lord, me, witch? How? <laughs> He said, you're manipulating figures. He said, you to trust me. So I said, Lord, I repent. <laughs> and I got me a mustard seed. I still have a whole bunch there. I've shown some of you before how tiny that thing is. I got an oak tag. And I made pockets on the oak tag and I pinned it up on the wall. And I, and I stuck with a, a strip of uh, sellotape. I stuck the mustard seed on the oak tag. And I wrote that this is all the faith I need to pay these bills. When the bills would come, I put 9X. How many of you remember 9X? If you ever lived in New York, <laughs> I'm dating myself, but it's okay. 9X was the phone exchange back then. I put 9X there. I put Con Edison, which was electricity. I put Brooklyn Union gas, which was gas. I put common charges because I lived in a condo. My rent was six fifty dollars a, a month. And my, my money from... Uh, <laughs> My money for welfare was $356 every two weeks. So it wasn't even enough for my rent. Praise God. Look at me today. His word is true. I testify. I would tithe on my allowance from welfare. I would tithe. I would give. Out of what was not enough. I've told you, if it doesn't meet, if a seed doesn't meet a need, or if, if, or if your money doesn't meet a need, turn it into a seed. Turn it into a seed. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11, keep on casting. Keep on casting. Present continuous tense. Your bread upon the waters. It's going to come back on every way. Right? Don't let pastors make you miss God when it comes to your finances. He says, Thus said the Lord of hosts, go up to the mountain, bring wood, build a house, and I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, said the Lord. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, who blew on it? Put it in the chat. Who blew on it? Whatever you brought home. Come on, talk to me. I'm looking at the chat. Who blew on it? Thank you. God. So you can be there and be binding and be losing and nothing will happen because it's not the devil. Take your hands off my finances. I bind you in Jesus' name. Jesus be like, hello, I'm the one. And you can't bind me. 
God said, I blew on it because you neglected my work and you're about your own business. You look for much, verse 9, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew on it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you stayed from dew, and the earth stayed from her fruit, and I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, upon men, upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Sometimes your financial challenges is because you're not honest, with God. You withhold out of fear. And fear is not trust in God. You withhold because you're irritated by what you see happening with all these multi-millionaires who are sitting on millions of dollars and I don't know what they're doing. In this country, the United States of America, four men, four, can eradicate world poverty. Four of them are enough. But will they do it? No. Rich people don't give up money. They don't. It's very hard for them to give you money because they measure everything by money. It's the church. That is God's mechanism for dealing with lack in the lives of people. That's why he said the widow, the orphan, the fatherless, the poor, and the stranger. I am their defense. That's why God said so. And it's through the church. Women, you are so precious to God. There is no point in your life where God designed for you to be alone. All you men that are here that are not married, and you're sleeping with these girls. I'm going to hold my peace. You won't like what I'm going to say. A young lady, there's no time in your life that God designed for you to be alone. When you were born, he gave you to a man. We call him dad. When his suitor came, he handed you over to him. We call him husband. And the scriptures are clear. It says, should he precede you in death for you to be handed back over to the church for the church to take care of you? That's what the Bible says. I wonder how many churches are actually looking after widows. The concept of us being one body is still strange to a lot of pastors. The reason why you tithe is clear in scriptures. The reason why you give is clear in scriptures. Giving is for you because it's a principle that God established, give and it shall be given unto you. Luke 6, 38. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. Men give to your bosom. Men give to your bosom. Not your job. Men give to your bosom. That's God's principle. The principle of the seed, Genesis 8, 22. While this earth remains, and it does remain, Seed, time, and harvest. It's a three-step process. Seed, when you plant it, time for it to grow and germinate and bring forth fruit, and then harvest. 
People think it's a two-step process, seed time and harvest. No, it's not. That's why you're impatient. If you sow, you will reap. It's an eternal law while this earth remains. And then given to the poor. The Bible says, he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. And the Lord is not a debtor. He will pay you back. Your tithe, your seed, your gifts, your love offerings. I told you at the, at the, uh, at the event, uh, Leaders Edge event, I said, when a seed leaves your hand, it does not leave your life. It goes into your future where you will catch up with it and harvest it. Sometimes because of fear, people are like, I give this, how am I going to manage? Like I said, you're not a manager. God didn't call you to manage. God called you to live in plenty. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. All right? They came and they did the work in the house of God. <clears throat> the four and twentieth day of the sixth month of the second year of Darius the king. Questions on chapter one. Good morning, Pastor Ram. Good morning, Kira. Um, I don't have my camera. I'm at work right now. But um, my question was, when did the Holy Ghost start to live inside of everyone? Was it when the, uh, Jesus died on the cross? First off, he doesn't live inside of everyone. He only lives inside of people that are born again. And he came in Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they were all in the upper room with one accord. And there came a sound as of a mighty rushing wind and filled the room. And there sat upon each and every one of them clothing tongues as of fire. And from that day, everyone that's born again, who desires to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, that person receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You receive a measure when you're born again. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God would have been tugging and drawing and orchestrating situations and circumstances to lead you to the point where you make a decision that you want to give your heart to the Lord. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Repentance and conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit. So when a person begins to feel out of sorts, they feel like, I, I really need to connect back to God. I really need to start living right. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And then when he, when he does the work of conviction, you can then uh, make the decision, because God is not going to tamper with your self-will. And then you then make the decision that you want to uh, give your life to the Lord. So by the agency of the Holy Spirit, you are pulled and you're tugged at, and your heart uh, begins to soften towards the things of God. And then you, you say the prayer. The prayer is in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. That's the prayer we pray to become born again. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will become born again. You'll be saved. So you receive a measure of the Holy Spirit at that time. And then in, uh, in Mark 16, 17, Jesus Christ said, these signs shall accompany them that believe. He lists a whole bunch of things amongst which he said they will speak with new tongues. He also said in John 14, 15, 16, uh, Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 39. He also said that you will receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it is evidenced by you speaking in tongues. That's the evidence that you have received him. All right. Um, there's a teaching on it. Jay, if you would, 
please repost it so that you can go back and listen to it. Does that answer your question? Kiara? All right, she's at work. And I hope she heard me. Uh, phone, I see a hand up. Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning, Mufon. How are you? Fantastic. It's Glory to God. <laughs> so I have two questions. I'm going to be a little bit greedy. Uh, my first question is when we read, so when we're reading, like what is the like the viewpoint or posture that we should be reading from? Because I wouldn't have been able to make the connection that you made in that first chapter of Haggai, excuse me, with um, our attitude in tithing that we see in the world. So that's the first question. Then my second question is referencing to tithing. So I grew up in Church of Christ and they talk about uh, offerings. They don't necessarily talk about tithing. And I know that some people say we're not supposed to tithe anymore. We've seen, you know, because there's no more, you know, you know we're not taking care of the Levites or whatever it is. But can you, um, can you connect the, the prescription of tithing to, um, you know, the New Testament as well? I know it's, yeah, that's my question. All right, your first question I wasn't very clear on. How I, you said you wouldn't have been able to link what the connection, and what. Yeah, in Haggai 1 with tithing, I wouldn't have been able to make that connection. So as we're reading, how should we be reading when we're reading? Um, like we should, how, how should we be like looking at reading the words? How should we be asking questions? That way we can be able to make these connections that you know, you're also making praise, and teaching us. Praise God. I've had a 40 year head start. How about that? <laughs> Praise God. That's number one. Number two, I am called to be a teacher. I know you don't see this ministry a lot and it's sad. There are teachers out there, but pastors don't give us room. That's mm -hmm. the truth. I've been saved since I was 17 and I was called in 1976, all right? God gives a minimum of two gifts, a minimum. There are 34 spiritual gifts in the Bible. He gives a minimum of two. We all have multiples because he will give you a dominant gift and he will give you a subdominant gift that serves the dominant gift. My dominant gift is to be a teacher of the word of God. My subdominant gift is to pastor because what is the essence of being able to teach and not knowing how to gather people? The pastor then. He does the opposite for the pastor. A person who's called to be a pastor, that's their dominant gift. He will give them a subdominant gift of teaching. Because you gather the people and you don't know what to do with them. You have to be able to teach them. And so because pastors can gather people and plant churches, they can also teach. And they won't call folks like me. I've seen it repeatedly. I go to a church, they don't call me back. Because their people begin to rave about this pastor. Oh, wow. Oh, this. Oh, that and the other. And they don't like it. That's the truth. But I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered. I care. When you tell me that I listen to this person or I listen to that person, I will be interested because you're here. And I want to be sure you're hearing what you ought to be hearing. That's the only reason why, why I will ask you, who is that pastor? What did he say? If you were not in my fellowship, I wouldn't bother. All right. So being able to link scriptures, I've told you, I don't teach with notes. I never know what God is going to do or say, never. But I have studied so much over the years. There's a lot on the inside of me that I don't even remember. And so when I read something from the scriptures, he tells me it's in Ezekiel, it's in Habakkuk, it's in Revelation, it's in Genesis. And he shows me how to piece it together. So that's how that works. Now the Bible says to covet spiritual gifts you can cover the gift it's allowed and ask him to give you the grace 
And I pray that you'll be much better than I am. All right, that's number one. Number two, what was your second question? Uh, clarifying tithes. People who talk about tithe the way they talk about tithe are ignorant, period. I don't care whether they're a bishop or a pope or a pastor or whatever, they are completely ignorant. There was tithing before the law. Come to Genesis. Jay, look for the scripture on Melchizedek. Let me have it, please. I may find it before you, but I don't want to take too much time looking for it. Abraham had gone and he came back and he gave tithes to the uh, priest at that time called Melchizedek. I want to give you the scripture so that you know. Genesis 14 and 20. Say again. Genesis 14 and 20. Thank you. God bless you. Genesis 14, 20. <clears throat> the Bible says uh, of Abraham. Let's go back to 17, Genesis 14, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Ched Chedoluama and the kings that were with him in the at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's deal. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram. This is even before he uh, God made a covenant with him. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thine hands. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave Melchizedek, the high priest of God, tithes. And that was before the law. So anybody that's telling you we're done with tithes, the person is ignorant. And the person doesn't understand the mind of God and the heart of God that wants to help the poor in the church. Where is the church supposed to get money to feed the poor, to help the homeless? Is it for foundations and unbelievers to do that when the church of the Lord is alive and well? So that's tithing before the law. Tithing in the law. When Moses came back from Mount Sinai, and it's not just 10 commandments he came back with. There are over 600 commandments that God gave the children of Israel. And that's why he suspended the dispensation of the law. Because it was impossible for man to keep all those laws. It was set up in such a way that if you broke one, you broke all. And it was impossible. So he introduced the dispensation of grace. That you and I are functioning under. He sent his son to die. To be the propitiation for sin. So that if you trust in him. You will no longer be held guiltless. We see it in law. Let's say Juanita is, is a judge. And they brought me before her. I've done something and the law prescribes that she either jail me. Or fine me $10,000. All right. Miguel walks in. Pays the $10,000. What's Juanita going to do to me? She has to let me go. Because Miguel paid the price. That's exactly what Jesus did. All right. So tithing in the law. Leviticus chapter 30 verse 27. Are you with me? Verse 20, verse, chapter 27 verse 30. Chapter 27 verse 30. And all. No exception. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. The tithe belongs to God. 10% of what you earn belongs to God. Whether you believe it or not is irrelevant. That's what the word says. All right? It is holy. It is separate. It is consecrated unto God. Verse 31, if a man will at all redeem out of his tithes, that's old King James English. What the Bible is telling you is, if you will use my tithe, all right, 
you will add to it 20% when you're bringing it back. That's what verse 31 is saying. If a man will at all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. That's 20% interest. The fact that God can charge interest on the tithe is proof positive that the money is his. Or can you charge interest on money that's not yours? He put 20% on it as a deterrent. Nobody who understands money wants to pay 20% interest. I don't mind earning 20% on my money, but I certainly will not pay 20% interest on any money borrowed. It's a deterrent. All right? So the time belongs to God. And if you withhold it, you rob yourself. Come to Malachi chapter 3. Or to Jesus. Let's read from verse 8. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Malachi 3, 8. It starts with a question. Will a man rob God? I want to ask you a question. What, what does it mean to rob? It means to take something from somebody that doesn't belong to you. Nope. No? Okay. No. What does it mean to rob? To take something from someone that doesn't belong to you and find you didn't finish it by force. By force directly in front of their face. By force. That's what it means to rob. It's different from stealing. To steal is stealth. I watch and I take it and you don't know. To rob is to show up with a 45 in your face and say, give it to me. So when you withhold your time, you rob almighty God. You hurt yourself. You're not hurting the pastor. And you certainly are not hurting God. All right? Will a man rob God? And the children of Israel answered, wherein have we robbed you? Mm. And God said, shut up, you clown, in tithes and offerings. <laughs> Verse 9, you're cursed with a curse. It's interesting that people want to claim the blessings in the Old Testament. But when it comes to instructions in the Old Testament, they don't want to obey. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes. It's an injunction. It is written in the imperative. It's not a suggestion. God is not saying when you feel like it, bring it. Bring it into my house. Why? That there may be meat in my house. Prove me now. This is the only place where God says to his people, test me. Prove me now and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You will not have room to contain it. Hmm. Guys, I, I live in a four bedroom house. I sleep in any of the rooms that I want. Hmm. I eat what I want, when I want it, how I want it, in what quantity I want it. But there was a time I couldn't. There was a time I'd feed my children with whatever I had left and I would go to bed without food. I would open a bottle of Dawn and pour it out in another container and mix it down with water. If I could stretch it. My son said when he got into his first apartment, he bought Dawn and he poured the entire bottle in the sink. 
because I would scream and shout, don't waste my soap. I didn't have money to be able to buy those things. So I had to stretch what I had. I picked up all the furniture in my house on the streets. I was driving down my street and I saw complete living room furniture. Nothing wrong with it on the curb. I went to ring the doorbell. And I asked the lady, I said, I see your furniture outside. Uh, are you throwing it away or your son in it? She said, I'm throwing it away. I said, may I have it? She started to cry. She said, yes, you can take them if you want them. As a matter of fact, come in. I stood rooted because this is a Caucasian and I am brown skin. She said, come in. Hesitantly, I stepped into the front porch before you enter the living room for her. And she was crying. So why are you crying? What's the matter? She said, I lost my husband. And all the furniture in the house reminds me of him. As a matter of fact, come up to my bedroom. You can have all the furniture there. That's how I furnished my house. 494A Lisk Avenue, Staten Island, New York, 10303. I ended up buying that house while on welfare. That's why I quit welfare. I told you my testimony. My landlord lost the house in a foreclosure, kept taking rent from me. The bank came to kick me out and I said, I'm not going anywhere. My rent is paid. He said, who are you paying to? I mentioned his name. The guy laughed. He said, we took the house in November. This is February. They helped me to get my November rent, December rent, January rent, February rent, one month security deposit. They helped me get the money back from him. And because I was a sitting uh, occupant, I got an FHA loan, 10% down payment. The house was $57,000, do the math. I was just shy of a few hundred dollars to be able to put 10% down. Nothing God cannot do if you trust him. The tithe works. Right? It's people who are hung up about money that can't part with money. And I've told you, money is not that piece of paper. That piece of paper is something you and I in this country have decided to attach value to and agree to make it a medium of exchange. So the absence or the presence of it in my pocket doesn't mean I have it or I don't have it. Money is not wealth. Anyway, where was I? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall be no room enough to receive it. That's tithing during the law. Tithing after the law. I advise you, do the one under the law because it's only 10%. In the New Testament, it's more than 10%. It's all. The Bible says they sold land, they sold property, they brought everything and they laid it at the feet of the apostles. And the apostles divided such that nobody in the church had a need. It's in the book of Acts. I don't remember the reference. Okay. It's uh, Acts 2. Thank you. The uh, fellowship among the brethren. All right. Thank you. So which do you prefer? 10% or go and bring everything and come and put it at Pastor Moose's feet. Praise God forevermore. Listen, listen, guys. When you love someone, 
a proof of your love is given. Love gives. I know there's a book running around out there that says the five languages of love and you've all read it. And <laughs> read the Bible, please. When you read anything, go back and read the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave. That is the language of love. I know that book says service. Service is part of love. If I love you, I'll serve you. I'll help you. I'll assist you. I'll do it willingly, joyfully, lovingly. There's only one language that love understands. It's given. All of those things in Gary Smalley's book, Five Languages of Love, I've read the book. It all goes back to that one word, love. Some people, they say, touching is, is, is my love language. <laughs> you're married to someone who doesn't like to touch so now it becomes a problem love does whatever it needs to do for the object of its love that's the reason why giving is not a problem to me I told you my mom's testimony at my 50th birthday. She said my mom had 11 children, eight survived. She said of all the kids that I have, Kumbi is the kindest. Love gives. All right. Mufon, have I answered your questions? Beautifully. Thank you so much. Praise God. Vincent, I see. No, I'm sorry. Pamela, I see your hand up. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Morning. Same to you. Um, so first and foremost, um, a statement. I agree. Um, a tad bit of my testimony. I have been homeless. I have been unemployed. And even if I didn't give but two dollars, God always provided. He always made a way. Um, just by being faithful and tithing. Um, my question is this, when you tithe, um, my view is you give 10% to the church no matter what. But like if you give outside of your tithing, some people will deduct it from tithing. Like just say um, a homeless shelter and you wanna donate money to it. And they consider that part of tithing. No. I think that's in addition to. The scriptures are clear. It says, bring the tithe into my house that there may be meat in my house. You tithe where you are fed. Where you get meat from, that's where you tithe. All right? If you want to do extra, like give to a homeless shelter or give to a cause or whatever, that's on top of. That could be your Luke 638. Give and it shall be given unto you. Right. Good measure, press down, shaking together right now. All right. Well, the tithe is clear. It's a tenth of your increase. Okay. And my second part to that, um, well, just a statement. Like um, we see pastors that are doing well. I think we need to change our view because the way that you teach it, other other pastors are teaching that too. So we can't look at how it manifests in the physical because we ask and seek, you know, he will provide. So um, from a point of giving, um, this has helped me change my perspective because just because they have the nice houses and the nice cars, they, they teach in the word and they learn in the word. So we have to, when we give, like you said, it doesn't matter um, what they have or anything like that because at the end of the day God sees the heart but it changes your 
my perspective, okay, they have that, but they read it and, and studying the word of God and trusting God and believing, and they understand belief and they understand giving to God through their service and other things. Because I have met some, some pastors that teach from the Bible, because I always go back to my word, but it helps me shift my perspective. So I just thank you for always um, pouring into us and giving us that mindset because I was reading and it just hit me, but I know it was the Holy Spirit. We have to look beyond what we see and look at what God is telling us to do and just be obedient. And I just thank you for, for always doing that, for always um, pouring into us the right way. Amen. Praise God. Vincent? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Pastor Mo. It's kind of the same question, kind of the same thing. I, I listen to your, your lessons on the laws of prosperity, and I understand tithing. I kind of, the whole tithing thing I get, and I tithe. But then there's giving and arms, and I just, and maybe you answered the question just now, because you just talk about givings, and, and, um, and I love to give. I mean, I, I give. But sometimes I wonder, like, I'll just give you one example. I was driving home last night and I saw uh, a guy and he was walking down the road. And he looked like he was either homeless or, or down on his luck. And my initial thought was, I'm going to stop my car and get out and give this guy some money. And I do that sometimes. But when I don't do it, I do feel a bit con convicted. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's, because I was questioning, I said, okay, God, do you want me to go back and give this guy some money? Because you talk about wisdom as well, to have discernment and wisdom about who you give to. So do you think it's not a right or wrong that in that situation, if I feel convicted to go back and give him some money, should I don't, just do it? Don't second guess yourself and don't second guess the Holy Spirit. Mm. All right. Um, sometimes you you want to do something and you don't do it understand mm. that you're led by the spirit of god the bible says in mm. romans 8 that as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god mm. all right if it was a pressing thing i'm sure god would have constrained upon you to stop and give it to the person i mm. usually would avoid giving people money on the streets for the simple reason that I do not know whether they are going to use it right. Some people, yeah. you might be empowering them to get drugs and, and whatnot. Um, mm. I've, I've run into someone before who said to give her money. I, I was coming out of at and and uh, I said, no, there's uh, mm. Chipotle next door. If you're hungry, let's mm. go in there and let's grab lunch together. And she said, no, she wanted money. And I, and I mm. went away because it wasn't about hunger for her. She wanted money, mm. and I don't know what she wanted to do with the money, and I, I wasn't about to give it to her. Um, sure. Giving of alms is very specific. That's giving to the poor. Mm -hmm. each, each of the types of uh, laws in the Bible concerning prosperity is, is specific. Your tithe is to God. Your given mm -hmm. shall be given unto you is for you so that you can get back. Mm. I remember when I once taught that somebody came to me after the service and said, you give to get. I said, precisely. How can you give only so that you can get? Because that's the way God set it up. I give so I can get, so I can give again. So I can get, so I can mm -hmm. give again. So I can get, so I can give again. If it stops with me, that's where it's a problem. But if I'm yeah. receiving from the Lord through people so I can give to others as their need shows up, I am a mm. channel that the Lord is using. So I give to get. Mm. All right. So alms is specific to the poor. My giving yeah. is so that I can get. That's the what, what the word says. My sowing is so I can reap. Mm -hmm. And sowing is targeted. I don't just get, see a parcel of land and I'm like, okay. I don't even own the land, but I saw that it's good. So I'm going to go and get some beans and get some rice and get some. No, it's targeted. The land is mine. I cultivate it. I prepare the soil. I put the corn seed in it. 
I cover it, I water it, I watch over it, I weed it. I give that seed the optimal uh, conditions for it to grow and return a harvest to me. It's targeted. So I want to buy a new pair of shoes. I sow towards it. Mm. I want to buy a new pair of whatever. I sow towards it. There was a time when it was that. Praise God, now I buy when I want. Glory mm. to Jesus. Okay, yeah. that's clear. Thank you so much. I've got one more question. Sorry, mm -hmm. everyone. I heard earlier you were talking about obviously now once we once we accept Jesus, um, you said from Romans, and then we're baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes to to live within us. So, with anything I'm not clear about, is if we were created as spirit, what's the difference? You know, when God breathed life into Adam. So what was that spirit when, then? When the Holy Spirit comes into you, that's why you have to be born again first. Mm. That spirit that was dead. And death, death in the spirit is not physical death. When God mm. said to Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit the day you eat it, you will die. They ate the fruit and they didn't die. Mm. Which tells you God wasn't talking about physical death. Mm. If it was physical death, the moment they bit into the fruit, they should have dropped down dead. Mm. So it's spiritual death. And spiritual death is simply separated from the father who is the father of all spirits. So you're dead mm. if you're not in Christ. Okay. So you get born again. That spirit that's dead within you is made alive. That's where the word born again comes from. And so sure. now when you receive the Holy Spirit, he comes to indwell your spirit. Mm. Okay. But your spirit is inside your body. God formed the body out of the dust of the earth. Genesis 2, 7. He breathed into it. The spirit of God went into it, gave it life, and also made it a living soul. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Think of your heart. The Bible talks about the heart all the time. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about that that organ that pumps blood. That's not what he's talking about. When the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked, it's not talking about the organ that's pumping blood. It's talking about a two-part thing. I don't know what other mm. word to use. Half is your spirit, half is your soul, which makes up the heart of a man. Mm. And that's what's living inside your body. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he occupies your spirit. Okay. And your spirit is supposed to now start to influence your soul. So that your spirit and your soul working together, Galatians chapter 5, keeps the body in check. Mm. But when the spirit is renewed, born again, when the spirit is born again, not renewed, Born again, made alive again. And the soul is not renewed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. With the word of God. The soul will align with the flesh. And they will keep the spirit subdued. That's the reason why if you're alone with a pretty girl, you can be speaking in tongues and unbuttoning your shirt at the same time. Mm. That's why Romans 12 to says, renew your mind with the word of God so that you may be able to yeah. prove what is that good, uh, perfect, good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And the way God taught it to me, God said, my heart is like a waffle with all the little squares in it. And God said, the more squares I control, I control your heart. The more squares the mm -hmm. devil controls, he controls your heart. Mm -hmm. So when I lie, Satan has taken one square. When I cheat, he's taken yeah. another square. When I swear, he's taken another square. If I continue like that, he will take most of the squares in the waffle and he'll control my life. But uh, if I do an act of kindness, I speak a word of kindness, I sow and I tithe and I pray and I fast and I do all the righteous works, God captures more squares and he controls my heart. And I'm able to keep this body in check.
Genesis, I see your hand up. Thank you, Pastor Mo. Hey, good morning, Pastor Mo and everyone else. Um, I'm actually at work, but uh, I had a question regarding the gifts that you had mentioned earlier. Um, first and foremost, though, thank you for these um, morning calls. It's definitely the start to my day and every day. But um, um, the minimum two gifts that you mentioned, how can you identify them? Or how do you know what gifts you have? All right, I've done a full teaching on it. I'm going to ask Jay to please post it. So you go yeah, and listen please. to it. And if you have any questions, uh, let's communicate by voice notes. It's easier for you to speak what's on your heart and for me okay. to respond to you. Yeah, voice notes on uh, WhatsApp. Like on WhatsApp? WhatsApp, oh, yes. I don't have you on WhatsApp, but I'll Download get it. it. I have it, but I don't have you on WhatsApp. All right, do you have my phone number? No. I'll send it to you. Okay, all right, thank all you. Right. Jay, please remind me to send my number to her. All right, um, Juanita. I see your hand up. That's my niece's name. Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I have two questions here. Um, and you probably have uh, already um, explained or shared this in your series, uh, The Laws of Prosperity. I, will, I probably came in uh, late on that one, so I would have to go and re-listen to that. Um, but can you share, um, share and break down the difference between money and wealth. People often um, articulate or perceive or understand uh, if you make a lot of money or if you have a lot of money, you're wealthy. So that's the first question. Um, and the second question is, um, can you share and uh, paint the picture on biblical wealth? Like say for instance, uh, like we look to the world, we say, oh, uh, Jeff Bezos, all those people are wealthy. You see what I'm saying? Um, and, and not to knock anyone's faith or anything like that, but like biblical wealth from what we perceive is wealthy, you know? Because I believe, you know, we could be, and it's, I believe it's God's desire and want for every last one of us to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, living out our calling and purpose and be rich and wealthy, you know, without any compromise and with our name still intact, with integrity, you know what I mean? And yeah, I, right. I realize often for some of us, I'm not gonna say all, cause God moves differently in everybody's life. It, it seemed like it's a little slow for some of us, you see what I'm saying? Because we refuse to compromise and are, uh, or uh, the Bible said a good name is rather to be chosen than silver and gold. So can you elaborate and, and, and speak on that a little bit? Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 18, the Bible says, you must remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. God is the one who gives power to get wealth. And he has a reason. Because the last part of that verse says, that he may fulfill his covenant on the earth. So what is God's covenant? What's the reason why Jesus came? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, we need money to preach the gospel. That's the truth. And that's why there is this divine economy in the Bible that we've been talking about. See? So wealth is a state of your mind. Money helps you to acquire those things that say to the world, you're wealthy and you're successful. But it's not, it's not the trappings that make you wealthy. Unbelievers have those trappings too. It's your relationship with God, knowing that you know him and he knows you and you're a vessel in his hands and he's using you to do the stuff that he would be doing where he on earth by himself. So God has prospered me and taken me from welfare to where I am today. Why won't I turn around and help people? 
especially when I know what it's been like. I don't joke with school fees. I don't joke with housing. I don't joke with hospital bills. And I don't joke with food. There are many people in this fellowship that can testify that I've paid thousands of dollars for their rent. There are several in this fellowship. And so if we are not looking after ourselves in the church by what we all bring such that no one lacks, why are we the body of Christ? There are principles, both natural and spiritual, that govern you becoming wealthy the way the world measures it. And if you're not working those principles or obeying those laws, you're not going to handle money. It's as simple as that. I was talking to one of our young folks, and I'm so excited that God called me to this generation. <laughs> uh, the way you guys are making money today, selling something they call NFT. Meta, that used to be Facebook. You can buy land and buy car and buy this and buy that and resell it. Intangible things. And people are making millions of dollars. My time, you needed money, you worked. Your generation has no business being poor. None. I can open a website, go to ABC company, get this gizmo, put it on my website, put $5 on it. People may not know about ABC company who makes the gizmo, but they'll see my website and they'll buy it. I run to ABC company, I pick up 10 gizmos, I send it to the people who bought it. I've made $5 on each gizmo I've, I've sold. I mean, there's so many ways you people make money now. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. So if, if you're not making money, <laughs> my son says your phone is not smart. Don't call it a smartphone if you're not making money with it. If you're not making money off of that device in your hand, then I don't know what to say to you. And it takes time to build wealth, guys. It takes time. A lot of the billionaires that you see today, it wasn't overnight. That's the trouble with uh, the network marketing industry. You come and you see the wealthy guys and, and they're telling you that it's possible because it is possible. Or well, you think it was overnight. This is my son's 19th year. You came into the industry two years ago. You, you, you want to have what he has. No, it doesn't work that way. It takes time. I was on welfare 93 through 95. I didn't step into God's goodness until maybe 2001, 2002. And then in 2007, God really opened doors for me. And then my son. So it takes time. And people don't have the, te the, 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 the tenacity to stay with something. There's an old English adage. It says a rolling stone gathers no moss. So you try this six months a year, it's not working. Then you try this two years, it's not working. Then you try that, it's not working. Then you move, you, you, you sh jump from company to company. And one of the things Believe Nations is teaching is that it's not the company, it's you. Mm -hmm. It's you. 
regardless of the company that you're in, if you have everything the way you should have it on the inside of you, you will prosper even if they put you in Sahara Desert. It's you, it's not the company. It's not the comp plan. It's you. I hope that answers your question, Juanita. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chris. Uh, all right. I do want us to finish uh, Haggai. It's just two chapters. So I see three hands up and that's it. Tiffany, Sonia, and Santa. And then we'll do chapter two. Tiffany. Okay, good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning. Um, yeah, one of my favorite chapters, I mean, uh, scriptures is Malachi 3, 8 through 10. I mean, that's one of my favorite ones. But I'm about to um, switch it up a little bit. I want to ask you, um, you said women should not be alone, right? So um, I was in a conference over the weekend and all the women had did this description of like maybe their husband who they want. Like we did it from, we didn't put a face on it, but we did, we described them from like maybe how they smell to how they look, you know, things like that. And so my question is, how do you feel about that? And then also, what do you feel about dating sites? What do I feel about dating sites? <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you feel about it? That man that you have described, uh -huh. have him not shower for three days and then let's talk. <laughs> no, I don't play that. What I'm trying to say to you is the body does not matter. We describe him, you know, how we want him to look. I, I have my description too. You do? Okay. I do. I do. I have my list in front of God. Yeah. So if we have our list, we know how we want. But what about if, we, if I got on a dating site and he don't look nothing like I didn't describe him, but then he might be, you know. <laughs> how are you going to find out what it's like when you've already disqualified him by how he looks? I know. I know. See, discover yourself in God first. Yeah. When you know God and you know yourself, then finding the right person will not be a problem. Yeah, it'll just come to, you know, God. I just feel that God will bring them, you know? That's number one. Number two, Adam was asleep while God was working on Eve. Is God done working on you? No, he's still working on me. Yeah. So Adam is asleep. He's still working on me. Adam yeah. is asleep if he's still working on you. I mean, I've came a long way. I, I truly believe that. But don't God continue to work on us forever? Of course he does. Okay. I asked you a question, you answered me, and I gave you an answer from the scriptures. Okay. Now, if if his we are all work in progress, every single one of us. But if Why he's worked on, if he's worked on the things that he needs to work on in you to make you the wife that his son needs, because it's not about you alone. Mm -hmm. That young man is his son. And he wants a good wife for him. So if he's done fixing what needs to be fixed in you so that you can be a good wife to him mm -hmm. and he's done fixing what he needs to fix in him so that he can be a good husband to you, he'll bring you guys together. He will. He brought Eve to Adam. Although I know your world today, girls are so brazen. They'll walk up to a man and tell him, what's up? <laughs> I'm still old fashioned. He will come find me. And he will honor me and love me as I deserve to be honored and loved. And I will honor him and submit to him as he deserves to be honored and submitted to. Amen. I'm old school too. I, I, I don't walk up to him, but I can give him a little look, you know, to let him know, you know, <laughs> that I'm feeling him. <laughs> All of that is based on what you see. And it's not everything that you see that is true. 
I know, Pastor Mo, it's hard out here. I know it is. I've been in it for, <laughs> what, 12 years. <laughs> okay. I'm settled. Listen, I'm settled. If God brings him, awesome. If he doesn't, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not bent out of shape looking for this person. He'll find me. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe we'll, we'll have a mass wedding. What do you say? <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Praise God. It's going to happen. He'll, they'll find us. Yeah, they'll find us. So yeah. we're, um, we're, we're, we're uh, in a place we're in a place where we're hearing the truth and the yeah. truth will set you free amen yeah they'll find us pastor mo this is where the uh singles retreat comes in <laughs> Ooh, I hear you. We've, been, <laughs> we've been talking about that it'll probably be sometime in october that sounds good but it will happen All right, I see Santa and Sonia. Sonia, let me take you first. Blessings this morning. I just had a quick question, um, not about tithing. Well, yes, about tithing, but um, when you're encouraging people that don't tithe any longer and they'll go, well, God's still blessing me or I'm still prospering, what is um, a good way to encourage them to be obedient to God, even though they feel as if God is still blessing them and they're not you, giving? You can't because of self-will. Yes. Tith tithing or not tithing doesn't stop you from going to heaven. You understand? You don't lose salvation because you're not tithing or God will withhold blessings if you're not tithing. No, you're just an irresponsible son period because if you're a part of the family you know you have your contributions to the family a husband yes. contributes a wife contributes the children contribute that's why we're a family and we we all know we have that one odd person in the family who never gives but always takes right or is it only my family that's different no, I mean, yeah, I, I guess here being here in ministry um, with my, well, now my mother was my parents and just seeing people give and they don't. And um, I know you just present the scriptures and you give them the word, but I know everybody does have a free will, but I don't know. I just thought maybe, and I guess it is choice, but I know God tells us that we are supposed to give our first fruits. Mm -hmm. um, so you just leave them and <laughs> let God deal with them. Let God deal or... with them. Let God deal with them. The truth of the matter is the work of the Lord will be done, whether people tithe or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. It just shows that people are irresponsible. You go to church, you know, bills need to be paid. Mm -hmm. You know, staff salaries need to be paid. Where do you think mm -hmm. that money comes from? But when somebody dies, you want the pastor to come and preside over the funeral service or there's a wedding then you come your daughter's wedding getting married you, you want the services that the church provides but you don't want to provide to keep the church yes. going yes so there will be those irresponsible ones amongst us there's nothing we can do about it but the work of the lord will continue nonetheless amen all right thank you all right um I said two last questions. What is your hand doing up, Jalil? I, I maybe didn't hear that. I maybe didn't hear that. Um, so if we, if we do have to depart, um, even though I want to teach, I want to teach chapter two because I'm not going to do one chapter of scripture tomorrow. Gotcha. Yeah. So let's take questions after this. It's just one chapter and we'll be done. Okay. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, 
the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remain, remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, that which they offer there is unclean. And now I pray you consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days where, when one came to an heap of twenty measures, there were about ten. When one came to the press fat for to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, there was but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet he turned not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive oil had not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. Praise God. All right. Um, this part of Haggai is... Uh, uh, records that they actually started to build the temple. They had listened to what Haggai had to say uh, about them just turning to their own needs and wants and not doing what they needed to do in the house of the Lord. So they had actually started. And um, Haggai was asking them, how many of you are over 70 who can rem remember what the original temple was like um, in comparison to what you now have? Uh, continues to encourage them, to strengthen them to be strong and so on and so forth. God uh, encourages them. He says, do not be afraid. As I promised you right from the time I took you out of the land of Egypt, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to take care of you. All right. God assures them. Uh, verses six and seven is actually prophetic and it's talking about the end times. Haggai's distant future, our future, not too far now because the Lord is coming back soon. All right. Uh, he says, uh, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations. That's another name for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the desire of all nations uh, and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. When we get to the book of Revelation, we will refer to this uh, verses six and seven, because after the battle of Armageddon, Jesus is going to establish his 1,000 year reign of peace and he's going to rule out of Jerusalem. That's what uh, Haggai is talking about here. Uh, it's double edged because the temple was restored and God's glory was restored in it. But the other side of it is when Jesus actually comes and he, uh, the desire of all, all nations shall come. That's when Jesus comes. That's what actually uh, places it in time. That's how we know that it's still in the future. All right. Um, now, now that the temple is uh, uh, up um, from verse 10 of chapter 2 going on, they are beginning to clarify the old laws that God gave them, what makes a man unclean, what makes a man clean, and so on and so forth. Those are the questions that you see being asked there. And God also, again, refers to their inequities, to their injustices, to their apostasy and all of that. He says, uh, I came to a heap of 20 measures 
but I found only 10 because people were not just. People were using false skills and balances back in the day. Uh, and God was, was upset with that. Um, he came to the press fat to draw 50 vessels, but there was only 20 there. And of course, God said, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and uh, uh, the labors of your hands. God, God did not let it prosper because God hates uh, injustice. He hates false balances. He hates inequity. And it was oftentimes what he would chastise the children of Israel about. I told you before, and I'm going to say it again, all forms of government are evil. All. Democracy, socialism, communism, uh, combinations of one or all of them, because they are all man-made. You cannot find justice in any system of government. There is, because it's all man-made. God's idea and what he wanted was theocracy where he would be our God and he would, he would, there would be righteousness in all of our dealings, in dealing with one another. I won't covet your husband. You won't covet somebody else's wife. I won't, I won't deal in an underhanded way with you. I won't speak ill of you. I, I mean, if we're all ruled and governed by the spirit of God, imagine what life would be like. That's God's mind. That's what he wanted in the Garden of Eden before the serpent slipped in and caused Eve and Adam to fall. And Jalil be quiet. <laughs> because you're still carrying on about Eve. <laughs> Praise God. The joke is lost on some people. It's because you're not on Telegram. And you were not in, in, in the session where, where we talked about it. Praise God. But Jalil knows what I mean. So don't you start with Eve. So that's what that's about. Uh, well, we thank God. We're done with the book of uh, Haggai. I didn't want to just do one chapter by itself tomorrow. Anybody has any questions? I'll take Jaleel and Ramona. Your hands Pastor, were up. Pastor Mo, you forgot uh, Santa. She had her hand up. You was going to ask her a question. Who? Santa. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me take Santa and I'll take Jaleel and I'll take Ramona. Let's go. Santa, where are you? We can hear you. Oh, okay. It was saying you can't unmute on my end. Okay, sorry. I'm, about I'm that. sorry, Santa. I I missed you. Oh no, it's no problem. I just actually had a had a comment. It's fine. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Vincent was saying um, earlier. I didn't realize it was so many hands up, but um, when Vincent was talking earlier about um being led by the Spirit of God, so I just had um something I wanted to say and piggyback on that uh, an instance that I went through. So this was years ago, but um, I had an instance where my daughter was really little and she and I were in Waffle House and I had tipped the waitress. The bill was like $12. I think I tipped her like $3 and we left. And we didn't get far from Waffle House. And I just kept feeling this urge to say, give her more, give her more, give her more. And so I'm sitting there like, give them more. Okay, well, the bill was only $12 or whatever. And God would not leave me alone. So I got maybe about two blocks from Waffle House, finally turned around and I was like, okay, okay. And I said, they're really loud. And my daughter was like, mommy, who are you talking to? She's about four years old. And I said, um, we're going back to Waffle House. And she said, why? I said, I don't know, God told me to. And so I got back to Waffle House and we walked in and the waitress kind of looked up like, what are you doing back? And I walked over to her and I whispered, I said, okay, this is gonna sound really crazy. I said, but God told me to give you this. And I gave her like $10. So that's what God had put in my heart. And I was sitting there politely explaining to God, okay, but God, if I give her this $10, that's more than what the bill was. So why am I giving her a tip that was more than the bill? Needless to say, I gave it to her. I said, this is going to sound really crazy. God told me to give you this. And she just burst out and started crying. And she said, I know why. And I said, oh my gosh. I said, why? And she told me, she said, I have been behind on my rent and my landlord has given me till to the end of the day, she said, and I've got to give him $300 by the end of the day. And I was like, oh my goodness. So we're both standing there in Waffle House and we're just 
balling and she's like you know I've got most of it but um I think she said she was like $90 away or something like that and um so we just sat there and we cried and so I just wanted to piggyback on that when Vincent was talking about being led by God and should you should you follow it even when it doesn't make sense because that made absolutely no sense to me and I did it and it was because they God was leading me to help her. And I actually went back the next day because as I was driving off, I wanted to go back and give her more. And it's like, God was saying, no, don't give her anything. Don't give her anything. I'm like, but she needs more. And it's like, he just wouldn't settle it in my heart to go back and actually give her more. So I actually went back the next day just to check on her. We didn't know each other from Adam to make sure. And she said, um, yeah, I actually got it all by the end of my shift. She said, my very last customer, um, I think she said tipped her like $10 or something like that. And so she actually ended up having a little bit over the 300, but God mm -hmm. made it where she got her rent. And God. that just warmed my heart. And it was not only good for me, but my daughter till this day remembers that. And I just love the way that this God operates, that he was able to use me, but he was also able to show her at that young age what he would do for people when you truly, you know, believe him and trust him and how he would do that. So I just wanted to, to add that to the group. Praise God. That's good. That's good. Janelle. Good morning. Sorry if I look uh, all over the place. I'm packing Jay, up the place. Jay. Jay, if Jalil mentions, he's muting. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Um, I actually got a question. I was having a conversation late night uh, with a friend. Not going to mention my friend's name. Um, and we were talking about a certain individual who isn't as holy um, as some might say. Um, but another pastor told this individual that um, she said it in this way. She said, um, she says, y'all don't know, but this woman is a pastor, but the lady, she lives a very sinful life. And so the conversation we were having was that God can call people even before they're all put together. And so I just want a clarification, you know, so me and that friend are not mentioning any names or anything. Um, so me and that Frank can have an understanding that God can call you um, even in front of people and qualify you before you're even completely there. But, you know, yeah. Your, your entire question, which is not a question, <laughs> is, is so vague. It's going to be difficult to answer you, but I'll pick on some points that will bring clarity to your conversation with your friend. Number Thank one, you. you are in no position to judge who is holy and who is not. All right? Because you said this individual is not living a holy life. Nobody's in position to make that assertion, except if you actually know the individual and you see how they live in. I say that because I've also had to deal with situations where people talk about being judged. And the, the truth of the matter is, while the scripture says, a spiritual man judgeth all things, judging is not the same as being judgmental. I can judge all things based on scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, I think it's verse 11. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse, it starts from verse 11, but verse 15 says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. So I can judge situations. I can judge things that have happened. If you go and steal, I can judge you that you stole. Because that's against the word of God. And I'm saying what I'm saying based on the word of God. 
I'm not being judgmental. I've judged what you did based on the word of God. So if you know this individual and they're living crazy, and everybody knows that they're living crazy, then you can say that this person is not holy. That's number one. Number two, um, God can call and use anybody. He saw Judas Iscariot, yet he called him to be one of the 12. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do, yet he called him to be one of the 12. Apostle Paul was a Pharisee that was supervising the execution of believers. He stood and watched them stone Stephen to death. Yet God knew that he was going to write three quarters of the New Testament. All right. So it is possible that God can take a man as vile in our estimation as that man is and still use him X amount of years, months, weeks down the road. Okay. But for the pastor who makes such a pronouncement, I think it's unguarded. That's my honest opinion. I think it's unguarded to make such a pronouncement on someone whose life you cannot vouch for. The Bible is clear. It says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Jay, look for that scripture for me. Lay hands suddenly on no man. What that means is do not endorse anybody too quickly. But I do know that, again, some pastors do it. Once they see you uh, come to their church, they see that you have a gift or you have a, you know, a sense of responsibility or you have money or something, they'll give you a responsibility in church. They'll give you a post in church. They'll give you a position in church. And it's designed to hold you or to keep you. That's wrong. So I, I can't speak to something that I don't have the facts but I've pulled out three, three points that I hope has helped you. I feel the, the pastor, the man of God who made the pronouncement uh, publicly said it unguardedly, especially if some people are of the opinion that this individual is not living right. I do believe that it's not in anyone's position to uh, declare who's holy and who's not. And I also know that God uh, will use someone regardless of how their past life is. Every one of us that's sitting here has a past. There's not one person here that doesn't have something that they would rather go to their grave with. So I hope that helps you, Julio. It helped Pastor Mo better than Eve helped Adam. That's where we're going to mute him at. <laughs> He don't mute himself already. All right. All right. All right. Jaleel, you're not going on recess. You will remain in class. You and I are going to have one more hour of Bible study. That's your punishment. <laughs> for mentioning Eve. <laughs> Whose hand is off? I think we're done. This Once again, man is having to do the punishment. Woman. I'll just okay. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> what you just said just means you don't want to be like Jesus, Jaleel. No, I, I want I want to be just like Jesus. I no, wanna... no, 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 no. You don't because Jesus died for his woman. <laughs> That's true. That's uh -huh. true. So you don't want to be like Jesus. <laughs> so now we know who you are. <laughs> That's I told not you. I, I said. said I said don't go there. <laughs> That's don't not what I said. Don't exactly. open up that can of worms. I'll show you. I'll show you that the female is God's favorite. You you think so? I know so. He made you guys out of dirt. He made us out of a finished product. He made you out of the beggarly elements of the earth. He made us out of a finished product. What do you have to say to that? Well, I mean, after he, I, after he finished a product, he took a part of it and finished it some more. 
Why do you think Adam said, this is now the flesh of my flesh and the bone of my bone? Why did he say that? I guess, uh, I mean. Everything that passed in front of him before didn't measure up. The cockroach, the giraffe, the elephant, the hippo, none of them measured up until God showed up with this creature he had never seen before. And he said, my God, you done outdid yourself. Wow, that's powerful this is, because- this is, it, this is the one. So the one came out of the one. How Just, many parents are here? <laughs> Jalil, you're pulling my strings. <laughs> How many have more than, more than two children? Not I. How do you feel about the last one? Really, we, we really shouldn't let them know. But how do you feel about your last baby? We are the last of his creation. We are his last born. He's soft on us. We can get away with anything. Jaleel, should I continue? I'm headed to my mom's house right now. Why, why, why are we rounded, women? Why, why are we soft? Why are we tender? And why are they so hard and and they were built to do the work they were built to carry stuff they were built to hew wood you think god doesn't know what he's doing tell you should i continue no i i get it pastor mom um i i totally get it um, go women <laughs> I'm going to take an offering from all the women. <laughs> and that, no, my, no. I know you men won't give this money. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. I love you, Jaleel. <laughs> Father, we thank you. What joy to be in your presence. We love you and we honor you. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for establishing us in the present truth. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We begin this week with you, empowered by you, graced by you, by you. Men and women, serve us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you all tomorrow at 9.